Hey farmers and landowners, this is Damian Mason coming at you with a question. Have you ever had disease or pest problems cost you money by reducing your yield? Well, of course you have. We fight this, right? That's what production agriculture is all about, is working as best we can to put out a great yield, and to do so, oftentimes, you've got to overcome disease and pests. The problem is we usually treat those diseases and pests after the problem, right? So what if you could do it proactively? What if you had a tool that gave you predictive analytics? so that you would know if you have things like corn rootworm, uh, soybean cyst nematode, sudden death syndrome. Well, you have that tool now. It's from Pattern Ag. Pattern Ag doing predictive soil analytics way beyond just the old days of sticking a probe in the ground every few acres and saying, hey, wow, we got some nitrogen deficiency here. They'll let you know if you have pests and disease. Go to pattern.ag. That's www.pattern.ag to learn more about this awesome technology and how it can help you increase your yields by taking care of diseases and pests before they cause you harm. Greetings. Thanks for being here for another fantastic episode of the Business of Agriculture with me, Damian Mason. I have a topic that frankly has been a bee in my bonnet for a couple of weeks, and I'm so glad you tuned in. We're talking today about revisionist agricultural history and rose-colored lenses. Okay, I want to just get this straight. This is the Business of Agriculture podcast. You are probably an agricultural professional working in industry with a farm background, maybe farm ownership. Maybe you're from an agricultural uh, upbringing. Maybe you're not. Most people probably in this industry still do have some tie to it. And you understand that this is a business. Fantastic. It is a business. I have a lot of farmers that listen to my podcast because we talk about Outlook and we have great guests and we talk about all the technology and the future and the money and the capital and all the things that are impacting this lovely industry. But what I haven't talked about in quite some time, and I do cover this with my audiences, is the rose-colored lenses and revisionist agricultural history and longing for nostalgia that seems to be prevailing still when people talk about food production. Now, you hear this from our friends in town and the suburbanites, and they say things like, I just don't like these industrial agricultural operations, these factory farms. And they formulate these ideas a lot of times based on what our detractors, the activist groups, come up with. But I don't like to see it happen so much when it's people that are us within our industry. Why has this been a bee in my bonnet for the last couple of weeks? If you're watching this on my YouTube channel, I'm going to hold up a picture right now. If you're listening, I can describe the picture and you can completely understand it. It's from Lee Lubers, one of my Extreme Ag guys, because you know I produce the Cutting the Curve podcast for Extreme Ag. Go to ExtremeAg.farm if you want to check it out. But Lee sent this picture. It's a 1930s era steel-wheeled John Deere. I don't know all of my John Deere antiques, so call it a B or an A model. It's from about 90 years ago. Next to it, is a brand new John Deere four-wheel drive, or at least front-wheel assist, uh, tractor pulling a big grain cart, and there's this juxtaposition, the old versus the new. I put it on social media, and I put out there how far we've come. And one of the points that I made was, you know, there was a lot more farms, and we're doing a lot more production with less farmers now. Boy, did this get people wound up, how terrible things are that you can't make it being a small farmer anymore. And, you know, these big equipment companies are putting us out of business. Some of the stuff was frankly embarrassing for me, an agricultural person, to read. And I finally decided I got to get this bee out of my bonnet and share it with you because I don't know where you are on this discussion. But I know where I want you to be if you're in this industry. I want you to be forward-looking. I want you to be accepting of the fact that this is, after all, a business. Farming is a business. I also want you to be conversant when we have our discussions here coming into the holidays, when at Thanksgiving, Aunt Martha, who talked to her yoga partner about the evils of factory farming, or Uncle uh, Clarence uh, carries on about how he heard that these CAFOs are polluting everything, or he heard that you can't make it as a small farmer anymore, whatever thing, I want you to be conversant about the, the data, the facts. Okay, so here's the deal. People went off, and some people didn't like my whole commentary about progress. Here is the deal. The good old days were not always good. 
I have to tell people this all the time. If you have not read my book, Food Fear, I devote several chapters about, it's about the past, present, future of agriculture, several chapters to debunking this idea about the good old days. I had someone say, yeah, in the old days, that antique tractor, it paid for the farm. Nowadays, the farm pays for the other tractor. This is utter bullshit, by the way. All the entire existence of agriculture has been mechanization and technology was brought to the farm to improve production, to produce, to produce more, to create an outcome of greater uh, production, right? And do we see that happening still because of the technology? Yes. On a per hour or a per unit of natural resource consumed, we have more caloric output. I just met with my dairy farmer over the weekend to do year-end business, the guy that rents my farmland. He's pushing 90 pounds of milk per cow per day. When I was a kid on the dairy farm in the 1980s, we were above average, and we did 50 pounds of milk per cow per day. So in about 30 years, I'm sorry, 35 to 40 years, we have nearly doubled our output of milk per cow per day with a little bit more feed, but certainly not on a conversion basis, double the amount of feed. You understand where this is going? Everything that we do today in modern agriculture generally has been about production and efficiencies and optimization of the natural resource units to create more product. Okay, now, where I'm going on this and why it's been a bee in my, my bonnet is because it's one thing for the ignorant consumers, and I'm not being mean, I'm just saying they're not farm people. They didn't grow up feeding the calves like I did or doing the work that you did on your parents' hog farm or uh, popcorn or whatever it was, cranberries. So it's one thing that they don't understand it, but it's bad when folks in our own industry look back with rose-colored lenses, and it's not even factually accurate, Okay. The good old days, I can go right to it. The 1970s, yeah, we had some boom years. Man, it was great. Farm economics were through the roof. And then came the 1980s. So when you say the good old days, well, that was 40 years ago. The bottom fell out in 81, 82. Some of us lived it. 40 years ago, would that constitute the good old days? Because I saw people crying at auctions as their assets were liquidated forcibly. Sheriff's sales? I saw fourth generation farming operations go kaput. This was 40 years ago. Would that constitute the good old days? And I always bring this up with my ag people when they say, or, or, sorry, our customers, about how they don't like these modern farming operations. You know, the good old days, things were more wholesome. Didn't use all that chemistry. Okay, that's not necessarily true. We've been using chemistry for about a century. Some of the stuff we use is pretty nasty shit, frankly. Uh, use some stuff right now that you can't even get your hands on. I would bring you another thing. Yeah, anthrax, stuff like that. Yeah, nasty stuff. We used a lot of tillage back then also. So these good old days that everyone pines for, back when this tractor rolled off the assembly line, you know what we did with this John Deere B? John Deere A? Somebody that's a John Deere person, go ahead and correct me. I won't be offended. I am not a historian when it comes to old machinery. You know what we did with this John Deere B with its steel tires? Put a two-bottom plow behind it if it could pull a two-bottom plow. And we took it out there and we plowed the hell out of stuff. Plowed and plowed and plowed. Plowed hills so they could wash away all winter. Plowed the plains so they could blow away in the Dust Bowl. Yeah, the good old days. Imagine how awesome it would have been to be back then. So when the people that are in our industry talk about this longingly, oh, the capital's too big. Can't get a farm, you know, no place for a small guy. Let me just tell you that that's kind of been the situation for a century. We hit, and I've dug up my book because I want to make sure I had my numbers correctly. We hit peak farm in 1935 with 6.8 million farming operations, 32 million farm residents. So I want you to think about that. Right now, today, I'm recording this in November of 2022. Right now, today, there are 2 million, 2 million and 40,000, but 2 million farming operations in the United States, 3.3 to 3.4 million farmers Back then, we had 10 times that number of farm residents. Of course, some of them would have been kids. Oh, wait a minute. We hadn't talked about that yet, have we? The good old days of the 1930s. You know, when Oklahoma, Kansas, and the entire Panhandle of Texas were blowing away? When the Okies had to get in their cars and go try to find work as migrants, hence the Grapes of Wrath, in case you have never heard of it by John Steinbeck, trails these, uh, trials these people, in fact, uh, about the Okies, how poor they were. 
So think about the good old days and put it in context, please. But I want to just go ahead and go over those numbers again. Three 0.4 million farmers now on 2 million farms. In 1935, that's 90 years ago almost, there was 6.8 million farms. We are less than one-third of that today. And again, you'll hear the people say, ain't that, ain't that a shame? We ain't got these farms. This was not done because of some evil uh, government program. This was not done by some sort of nefarious force. This was done by evolution of economics. You could go to town and get a job and maybe live better than you could out there with your primitive agricultural operation. And back then, you suppose they were saying, oh, only big farmers can survive. Of course they were because we've been consolidating since this country was settled. But in particular, we've been consolidating agricultural operations since the 1930s. That's why there are 2 million farms as opposed to 6.8 million. The idea that somehow back then you could be small is actually a misnomer. When I look back at my farming operation growing up as a kid in the 1970s and 80s, we were not small. We farmed five or 600 acres, milked about 60 cows. You'd say, oh, it's quaint by today's standards. Yes, it was, is, I'm sorry, quaint now, but it was not then. So while we're debunking, while we're debunking some of these preconceived notions or things that people say now, I want to point out about the machinery. There's this idea that, again, I'm going to hold up this picture, that machinery is so much more expensive now that you could never justify owning it, whereas back then it just was easy to do. That's not necessarily true either. First off, let's talk about farm economics. We get across more acres. We do more with larger, more efficient machines than we did back then. You had to go over your ground a whole bunch of times back then. So you might have a, for, on a per hour basis, have spent less, but that's because you were using lots of hours to do inefficient tasks because you didn't have good technology. They didn't have GPS, didn't put trace amounts of spray and fertilizer on places based on GPS and all the things that we have now. We used a lot more resources per acre farmed, a lot more time per acre farmed. So when you talk about the dollar amount for the machine, yes, it's mind-boggling. Yes, it's daunting to look at something that costs a half million dollars, three, three quarters of a million dollars for a sprayer. It can be daunting. I get that. But look at the productivity. Look at the output per dollar spent. It becomes an ROI issue. If I had a factory and I say, in the old days, 100 men were in here doing this job. Now we've got robots, and that's a bad thing. Well, no, it's not really a bad thing because we've probably made the, prop the factory more efficient. We have more output per man hour invested. You see where this is going. So I want to give you some more numbers just to kind of put this in perspective um, about, uh, about the past and the present today. Okay, so we know that we've got a consolidation issue going on. Um, if you listen to my podcast, going back a few months ago, I had uh, the gentleman from Aimpoint Research who said we got about 175,000 farms of scale. Not being mean, but in the United States, of the 2 million farms, 175,000 of them are like the couple thousand acre operations, do the bulk of the production. Uh, it's no secret if you've ever heard me speak. 5% of the farming operations produce three quarters of all farm revenue. This is just the way it's always been. 58% of America's farms. This is the most recent ag census of 2017. 58% of America's farms, 58% of those 2 million, do not sell $10,000 worth of agricultural output per year. 58%, almost, almost two-thirds, do not even produce $10,000 worth of agricultural revenue per year. Okay? So the idea that there's no place for a small farm, there's all kinds of place for small farms. But do you want to live that way? You see, the nasty part of this is the economics. I'm going to get more into that in a second. But before we do, I want to remind you, if you are an agricultural person, you probably spend a lot of time looking for information. You can go on Twitter and you can, you know, see what your Twitter sphere says or go on Ag Twitter and then get degraded because that's what happens a lot there. Twitter's kind of a toxic place. Don't know what's going to happen now under the new ownership, but I can tell you that I have people on there that want to fight with me, degrade me, tell me I don't know what I'm talking about, whatever. That's not what you want. If you want information, why don't you go to AgVisor Pro? It's an app on your phone. It's as easy as just typing in, go to your app store, AgVisor Pro. Pro. AgVisor Pro is a company that was founded by my good buddy Rob Syke, Canadian agricultural entrepreneur out there in Alberta. 
And you know what? He created AgVisor Pro because he says 19% of a farmer's time is searching for information, trying to solve a problem. Why don't you shorten that time? As Rob always says, shorten distance and time, and you will therefore make more money. And so this app, AgVisor Pro, shortens time and distance and puts you in connection with an expert. You also could become an expert. If you are an expert at ragweed eradication, by golly, put your profile up on AgVisor Pro, and then you can be the expert to help others. You can also get paid. Yeah, you can find consulting gigs this way. That's the beauty of AgVisor Pro. It can be free. You can give your information for free or you can charge for it. You can find others that will give you information for free or charge you for it. It is shortening time and space. That's the concept of AgVisor Pro. Go check it out. All right. While we're talking about the realities versus the rose-colored lenses, I want to point out some other realities. I gave you the dairy example, and I could do that on everything. My friend Todd Thurman co-host of the Business of Ag Success Group with me, uh, he would tell you that we're producing more pork right now in the United States of America with less sows per pound of pork produced than has ever happened before. These efficiencies go on and on and on. In fact, we're probably going to get to a point where we're so darn efficient, we're going to struggle to find buyers. Yes, that day will come. Trust me, it will. That day will come where we're getting more and more productive and we'll struggle to find buyers because of a lot of reasons, other countries ramping up their production, etc. So there's not one thing that you can look back to the old days and say was better than today in terms of production. And you say, yeah, but about making a living. You know, mom and dad could live out there. Mom didn't have to work. She just raised the kids, farmed 80 acres. Well, let's talk about those economics because that's not true either. Now, maybe in the 1940s it might have been that way, but my senses tell me that a reason a lot of people left the farm and went and worked at factories during the industrial uh, growth era of the 1940s and 50s, post-World War II, is because life was easier living in the suburbs. You know, I grew up on one of these operations without hired help, where it was me and a couple of my brothers doing the work. All we did was work hell Work, work, work. A vacation was an afternoon of driving to Indianapolis to go to the state fair once every couple of years. We didn't miss a milking, for God's sakes, twice a day, every single day. So this glamorized vision of how things used to be, how wholesome it was, it was a lot of work, okay? My back is shot. I got no discs under my last three vertebra. You know why? 10,000 small bales of hay and straw every summer picking up rocks every spring. The point I'm making here is let's do ourselves the favor of not only talking about the productivity, but let's also talk about the lifestyle. The idea that you could live on 80 acres, maybe sort of, by the time I came into being, if you had 80 acres from trying to be a small farmer, you were a teacher. Your wife was a teacher and you were a teacher and you farmed 80 acres. You had a job in town and farmed on the weekends and evenings. You also maybe could have had, you could make the argument, every farmstead around my part of the world, people raised hogs. Does that happen now? Do you have a feeder barn with hogs? Not probably, unless it's a massively big one with 4,000 pigs and you're on a contractual arrangement. So those things have changed. But again, let's be realistic about this. You had to come home from work and farm your little 80 acres and go out and take care of the hogs. It was nice. You went out there and did it. Well, except for the fact that maybe if you had a big problem, you had pseudo rabies or whatever, you had a disease issue. You see, there was a lot to be done and we had a lot more problems back then. We're better at handling stuff now. I can tell you about the cow herds, I can tell you about the livestock herds and how we are generally more efficient, but also we handle things better with less units of natural resource. Let's talk about the consumer. The consumer might think that this is a cool deal, that there was this time where there was an old McDonald's farm on every corner. But the food until the last two years with this whole entirely government created manufactured inflation issue that we have right now, up until then, the price of food in real dollars was going down every year. We were down to, three years ago, we were down to 6.4% of America's income, gross, on average being spent on food. There's a big benefit to what we have in our modern food system. There's a big benefit to lifestyle for the people out there producing it. You don't have to work as hard. You can sit in a tractor that's air conditioned, that steers itself, and you can be more productive by doing so than you could have been on the John Deere B of 1935. Let's talk about other lifestyle issues. The person that ran that John Deere B had a lot of hearing damage because you're on this thing that made a lot of noise. Doesn't happen in this town controlled cab now, does it? 
my hearing shot from being on tractors when I was a baby. Doesn't happen that way now. See, there's a lot of benefits that we need to make sure we're looking at about the modern agricultural system. Now, the one thing that did bother me in the social media thread that created this whole topic for me was someone that said, agriculture in America now is just nothing but a, 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 a basically compare it to the feudal system. where We have uh, kings and then serfs and peasants. That was the system for many years and still is in many countries. And they're kind of alluding to the idea that now you've got these large agricultural operations and then the rest of us work for them. Well, my grandfather came to this country in the 1890s and was a herdsman milking cows for other people that owned cows and acres because he was a poor kid and couldn't do that. So we're going back 120 years ago when this was the system. So to pretend that this is something new that you, if you don't have resources, work for some agricultural operator who does is not really new. What's the big thing that I would say is a struggle on the modern agricultural system? It's capital allocation and capital requirement. But again, I'm going to shoot some holes in this idea that this is a new phenomenon. In the 1970s, you had to have a lot of capital to buy machinery, and I heard the people talking about it back then, that you got to be a certain size, otherwise you won't be able to do this. This has been going on for at least 50 years, if not more. Trust me. When the person came home from the John Deere dealership with this John Deere B 90 years ago, the guy down the road said, I wish I could afford one of those, but I don't have the money because it takes too much money to buy one of those modern tractors. I'm just going to be out here with my draft horse and my mule. Where am I going with all this? I already told you. I'm going, I want you to be more conversant. When you get together the holidays, don't let people tell you about how things are so radically different today and how modern agriculture is the bane of our existence, how it was always more wholesome back then, how the economics were better back then. That's not true. Now, let's, again, go back to the lifestyle issue. Do you realize that infant mortality until, well, still today, in rural America is worse than it is in the cities and the suburbs. Do you realize that in the country, uh, we were without indoor plumbing until way after all of the cities had indoor plumbing? Do you realize that we had a lot more uh, early deaths in the country during the good old days, farm accidents? We were, uh, even in the 1970s when I was a kid, we were still the number two most hazardous career path behind mining. I haven't looked lately. Be careful about the revisionist history of how grandpa got away with this or grandpa was able to do this. Um, my cousin was carrying on like this about a decade ago, but how it must have been nice. Have your 80 acres, got your chicken house over there, got your hog barn over there, got your main barn where you milk the cows. Man, you just got, well, first off, do you know why they had all those buildings separated? Because there's a very good chance that one of them would catch on fire. Because you were out there with a lantern trying to get the damn cows milked in the dark. And you know what? You didn't have good electricity. And you probably didn't have a good uh, way to pump water. So if the building caught on fire, you hoped the other one didn't. So you could still have enough food to eat because your barn burnt down. That's why we had all those little separate buildings. Oh, well, there's also disease issues. Why do we have disease issues? We had to keep all the animals separate because we didn't have good antibiotics. We did not have good veterinary care. The wholesome good old days, we had brucellosis, trichinosis. Name the animal malady of the good old days, and we had it. So keep the animals separate as best you can, and that will keep the disease pressure down because we don't have good veterinary livestock practices. Oh, you know what else? If the place catches on fire, we got no way of putting a fire out. Do we have these issues today? Not to that degree. Need I continue? Just do me a big favor. When you hear folks sitting around the Thanksgiving dinner table telling you about the good old days and how this turkey came from a factory farm and how you can't make it out here as a small guy, please put some perspective into this and realize that what we have is a safer, more abundant, more affordable food, and again, the food issue right now, the inflation we're seeing at the grocery store, has nothing to do with agricultural practices, has nothing to do with what we're doing out here in modern farming methods. It has everything to do with the cost of energy, which has been artificially inflated because of government mismanagement. It has everything to do with labor costs, which have gone up because of the government throwing money at a marketplace and paying people to not work. It has nothing, the new price of Thanksgiving dinner has nothing to do with what's happening on America's farms in terms of our production, our methods, our practices. 
our inputs, it's because of other reasons. And also, remember that the perspective is important for you as an agricultural professional to share this. I would also give you a couple other things about the numbers. Because when people carry on about the good old days, and yes, if you're listening to this, I'm holding up the picture again of a modern machine versus a John Deere A, B, whatever it is. Something that belongs in a museum, belongs in a parade around the fairgrounds once a year with the old timers. When we look at uh, a lot of these uh, situations, if you will, um, about the loss of small farms, um, this may be a reality and it may be happening. There are also, as I point out, uh, and I point this out in my book, let's compare this to everything else. Turn of the century, my home state of Indiana, there are over one, more than 100 automobile manufacturers right here. One, I'm not talking about different little plants where they made them. I'm talking about 100 different automobile manufacturers in my home state of Indiana. How many are there today? Well, we've got a Honda plant, got a Toyota plant, got a GM plant. But the point is, are you better off now than you were then? You're a consumer. You use the cars, right? You drive a truck. Are you better today driving the Toyota Tundra that's made in Princeton, Indiana, or the GM Sierra that's made in Fort Wayne, Indiana? Are you better off today than you were then? Is the consumer better off? Is the product better? On a dollars per utility derived, that's how we really should talk about the cost. The dollars spent per amount of utility derived, that's an economic concept. The dollar you spend and what you get in way of benefit out of it. Are you better off per dollar spent than you were when you bought a 1920s pickup truck that was made by one of these little manufacturers that made nine pickup trucks a year? I'm going to go ahead and tell you that yes, you are. That's where we have to always bring this back to the business. The consumer has benefited. Are there some struggles? Is it hard for a young person to get into agriculture? Yes, it is. But you know what? It's not on a niche basis. Look at the positives. When they say a young person can get into farming, a young person can't get into, with no capital, can't get into corn and soybean and wheat production because those are commodities. Just like a young person can't go start building trucks because General Motors already has a pretty good capitalized system and knows how to do that. You see where I'm going with this? A young person can't get into agriculture producing a commodity because there's very small margins and huge capital requirements. But right now, through the internet, and through a more open-minded consumer base, a young person could get into agriculture with five acres and a creative idea about doing something that's organic, that is something that is hand-grown, something that is off the radar, something that is not a pure commodity that favors size and scale of economics and therefore commoditized production. When you say a young person can't get into agriculture, you're saying a young person can't do the way things did, uh, the way a grandpa did uh, 100 years ago. And that might be true. But remember, grandpa also was in a commodity production uh, situation, and pretty soon somebody down the road got bigger at it and better at it and said, you know what, grandpa, I'm going to buy you out. And that's been the story for a long, long time. Please do yourself and everyone you know a favor and put this thing in perspective. The good old days were not always good. And also do correct people as you sit down at the holidays when they're going on and on about how things are and how things used to be. As I always tell people, my dad once had some flaws. My dad, though, never carried on about the good old days. My father lost his arm as an eight-year-old boy. He had a compound fracture, and it got gangrene. They were herdsmen. They were, they were tenant farmers. They did not have any money. He got a compound fracture, which means a bone broke the skin. He got gangrene and had to have his arm amputated twice, actually, as an eight-year-old boy. So my dad didn't carry on about the good old days and how modern stuff is bad because he was been about 70 years of his life with no left arm. You see, the good old days sometimes were not always good, and that's with everything. It's particularly that way with agriculture. Please, always give a little perspective to this. Share this with your friends that don't know, that didn't grow up in the industry, and mostly share it with those people that seem to always harken back for some simpler time. Because you know what? Working 14-hour days without adequate herbicide, without adequate hearing protection, out there on your John Deere B, going over the ground 17 times because you're trying to keep the weeds from growing, and therefore your ground is blowing away in a dust storm or washing away with wind and, and, and uh, water erosion all winter long, Hmm, those days weren't always good, were they? Weren't good for the rivers and the streams? Weren't good for the environment? Weren't good for the farmer? 
You imagine the miners right now that are mining coal with manufacturing equipment. They're maybe sitting at a computer. Do you think they're looking back to the good old days when you mined with a pickaxe and a shovel and then died of black lung? Uh, put some perspective into it. Anyway, I'm Damian Mason. Thanks a lot for being here. Do yourself a favor. Uh, if you are looking for information, just go check out the AgVisor Pro app. It doesn't cost nothing. Just go on there, App Store, AgVisor Pro and see if there's anybody that might be able to help you out or maybe you can help out by being the expert. It's all about information and we talk about sharing information and shortening time and distance because that's where you can make some more money. Appreciate you being here. Uh, hey, have a good time. Till next time, it's the business of agriculture. Hey friends, this is a suffix, if you will, a sequel to the podcast that you just listened to. And the reason is because I recorded it this morning and then was doing my work, got in the shower, and like you, I have creative ideas when I'm in the shower. I'm like, wait a minute, I hadn't even addressed the one criticism that really got in my bonnet, and I needed to address that to finish this podcast out. In the Ag's revisionist history and rose-colored lenses, there's this really overriding theme, big versus small. And I don't want to be perceived that I'm all about pro-big agriculture and small farms should be put out of business. Quite the contrary. I want everybody to be in this business that can viably, sustainably, and profitably be in this business. The tough part, as I already alluded to, vast commodity production just generally has always gone the way of size and scale. So, I'm not anti-anything, but I guess I want to bring up this thought. <clears throat> and because I had a person on social media that told me it wasn't progress to keep getting bigger. Well, okay, maybe not. But generally, if you said uh, Walmart, I know they're the demon, but they also bring low-priced goods to much of America, particularly rural America. Um, did the SUP plant the five and dime store downtown in Main Street, USA? Yes. Uh, did they do that by force? No, they did that by economics and by delivering something to the consumer that the consumer obviously wanted. That's why they went there and bought it. So I think we got to be really careful about this revisionist history about how the old days were wholesome and small scale was better than large scale. First off, they weren't small of their time. Um, look at the equipment. A John Deere 4400 combine in 1976 was a big, huge piece of equipment. It just looks like an antique now compared to the John Deere X9, right? Or 9X, whatever. So the point is, it was not small of its era. We weren't talking about the benefit. Remember, in 1976, the person that bought the John Deere 4400, somebody down the road farmed one-fourth as many acres and had a pull behind the farm all H type of a combine and then lamented that they were not being treated well because they were the small farmer. So this has been going on for a while and I'm just telling you it's a matter of scale. But the other thing is I don't want to be misconstrued that somehow I am anti anybody because I am not. I would say, again, to the person that wants to be starting out, that wants to be small, the capital requirements are such that you're going to have to find a niche. You cannot be in a commodity production realm unless you're very well capitalized, inherit something, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, there's the other part. And this is something when I had one of the detractors, which, of course, I banned because he just wanted to fight with me and say stupid shit on my Facebook feed. <laughs> I, I would ask you this. Well, Call it progress, don't call it progress. But the main thing this guy kept carrying on about was big is bad, big is bad, big is bad. My answer is, or my question, I guess my retort would be, what's your solution? What's your proposal? Um, if you have the idea of revisionist history that somehow everything was small and everything was better when it was small, even though of their era they weren't small farming operations, they were normal sized operations of their era, they look small now. But the main thing I would say is, What's your proposal? What would you do? What would you change? If this is good and you believe beneficial, and maybe our consumer believes that also, they love to go to the idea of small farm, take a hayride, pumpkin patches, and all that kind of stuff. If it's what we desire, how do you create it? Do you make a moratorium? You can no longer have any farms more than this many acres. 
that's going to be cheated, gamed, etc. Then they say you can't be more than 4,000 acres. Well, the person that's farming 12,000 acres right now is just going to split into multiple units. Then they'll have equipment sharing agreements, etc., etc. So there's really not a viable option if this is somehow the objective. And I hear this a lot. And again, I guess this is what I, I failed to mention in my first part of this podcast. If this is the outcome that you desire or that you think that the general consumer desires, or if you think the majority of agriculture desires, all of a sudden you go a lobby that the USDA create this sort of arena. You'd say, well, it works in Canada. They don't have moratoriums and size restrictions in Canada. They have supply restrictions, meaning you can't sell milk to a processor beyond what your quota is. You can't produce more poultry than beyond what your quota is. So it's supply management, and that is not because of a vision that small farms are better. It's a matter of price stabilization. The reason that Canada has uh, supply management is to keep prices stable and profitable. It's not because they hearken for the day of everyone farming 40 acres. Um, <clears throat> so I guess I would point out to the people that pit this revisionist history and look back at historically with some sort of um, nostalgia that it's better and we should return to that, I would say, how do you make that happen? Do we need to div- divvy up General Motors and say you need to be all those little companies that comprise General Motors? We need to reinvent Pontiac. We need to reincarnate Oldsmobile and they need to be on their own and not under the GM umbrella. In fact, Oldsmobile needs to be cut into five more companies because it's still too big. Do we go about dismantling agricultural operations? You'd say, well, the USDA policy favors large ag, and I've read that. I've read it in places like the New York Times or NPR, which are left-leaning and generally anti-capitalistic modern agriculture. That's not really true. Do you realize that most USDA programs uh, have certain restrictions on how much you can uh, uh, be eligible for? Number of acres covered or number of cows insured or whatever this thing should be. Plus, they have income restrictions. If you make above a certain amount of money, you can't be in a program. It can be argued that the USDA already favors small scale, small scale and inefficient operators. Uh, In many regards, uh, the smaller scale operations benefit, shall we say, exponentially more on a per acre or per cow or per pig or per unit uh, uh, operation uh, production uh, than the large scale with income restrictions and certain of cap outs. Going to my large scale dairy operator that uh, is my tenant. Uh, he can, for instance, get some sort of dairy milk margin coverage, but only up to a certain amount of gallons or pounds of milk, which end up being about one month's worth of his production. Whereas if you're a small scale dairy operator, you'd probably be less efficient. You'd probably be getting less milk per cow, but you also would get more coverage or maybe even your entire year's production covered because you don't hit a threshold. So be careful on the nostalgia thing and the revisionist thing. When we get into the big versus small and some how big is bad. Now, again, I'm not taking a side. I'm just telling you what the evolution has been and the reasons for it. It's been because of economics. It's been because of efficiencies. It's been because of production uh, gains when it comes to commodities that favor size and scale. So if you're going to tell me that we need to limit that, I would ask you how one goes about that. You know, we're not talking about busting up trusts like uh, Teddy Roosevelt did or when we busted up Ma Bell. We're talking about farming operations. So do you go about dismantling those? The other question I would have is, um, if indeed we think that big is bad, what's the reason? What, what is the reason? One person pointed out in the uh, stream of my social media that we we're going to limit the number of people in charge of our food supply and that that was bad. In other words, the real evil of big versus small is that we consolidate food production power into the hands of a few. Well, we've kind of already been there for a while. Again, 2017 Census of Ag tells me that 75% of all agricultural product sold revenue-wise was produced by 5% of America's farms. So is it realistic that we're going to somehow be held over the barrel? If it were two producers or four producers, you might make that argument. But 
it might be 105,000 producers' farms. And can they really collude and then control our food and uh, keep us over the barrel? Probably not. Bigger example of that, frankly, is happening right now in meat processing. The big four control 80 plus percent of all meat produced, processed that is. And is it to the point where we don't have food or they just hold out and tell us they're not going to feed us if we don't meet their demands? And that's with four. So the likelihood of somehow a smaller number of large-scale farmers, meaning uh, we get to 100,000 or whatever that number should be, that they're going to really keep us over the barrel is kind of a little bit far-fetched because it's already not happening, uh, say, in the meat sector. Do they do sometimes uh, get get accused of price fixing? Yeah, that's happened. But they haven't really kept the supply down to harm the populace. So those are the questions I had. I, of course, came to this after I went and got in the shower. And like like you, I'm sitting up there going, wait a minute, I didn't even get to these other two big things that I heard from my detractors. And I wanted to cover that for all of my listeners. So anyway, thanks for being here. And for the sequel, the suffix, the add-on, the bonus track, if you will, uh, to this episode of the Business of Agriculture. Till next time, thanks a lot for being here. I'm Damian Mason. Hey, thanks for being here. This episode of the Business of Agriculture was brought to you by Pattern Ag. You've heard me talk about Pattern Ag because I think it's a pretty cool concept. New technology that allows you to predict the problems you're going to have and therefore treat them before those problems cost you money. What kind of problems am I talking about? Pests and disease. Things like corn rootworm, uh, sudden death syndrome, cyst nematode, and a whole bunch of other bad things that happen out there in the field that can cost you money. Guess what? Pattern Ag will let you find out ahead of time if the disease or the pest pressure is there and therefore you're treating it before it costs you any money. What a great concept. Go to pattern.ag, that's www.pattern.ag to learn more about their product, their technology, how it can make you money, save you yield, and all also where you can find a rep that can come out there and do the work for you. Pattern.ag.